This is just going to be a short presentation on how I prepare material, uh, collections material for phylogenomics and trait assessment. Um, so first, the goals of such a workflow should be to identify collecting events, which should be attributable to uh, unique locations, dates, time can be included in that, meaning the time of day that the collecting event occurred, the collectors involved in the event, and the collecting methods. Um, then there should be unique specimens that can be attributed to collecting events as well as other metadata. Just as an example, um, housing institution might be one of those pieces of metadata, but you could have other uh, pieces of information that are unique to the specimen like um, well they're not unique to the specimen actually they're just characteristics of the specimen um, so it might be like the owner institution might be different than the housing institution for example if it's on loan or whatever so that should be able to be tracked and then um, derived data for example morphological data or actual tissues or phylogenomic data so sequence data that might be on GenBank or in a publication that should also be able to be attributed to unique specimens and sort of through this chain of connections or links you can connect that to institutions you can connect that to collecting events you can collect that to particular collectors etc so my process really begins at appending unique identifiers and I have three different classes and you know a given specimen may have all three types of these unique identifiers added they may only have one of these types of unique identifiers added it just sort of depends um, on what I felt was necessary or what I had access to at the time but they should have at least one of these types of unique identifiers. The first type are collection-based unique identifiers. So here's a few examples from the Milwaukee Public Museum as well as the um, Colorado State University Museum where they're given some code that denotes the collection and then usually a long string of digits that is unique to that specimen and that specimen only in that collection. Uh, the second type are event-based unique identifiers, which these can vary a lot um, because you can construct them in different ways, but essentially they are unique to the specimen and to some extent they're human readable with some kind of rules to how they're constructed. So here's an example of the ones that I use. They generally begin with a three-letter um, three code for the locality. Typically, that's going to follow ISO 3166-1 um, country codes, so like BOL would be Bolivia. But I also use three-digit codes for states within the United States because I have so much material from those places, and I didn't want to use a four-digit code. So here is ARZ for Arizona, for example. Um, then there's a two-digit year that follows that, so 99 would be 1999. And then an event ID, which can range from, it's two digits, and it can range from, for example, 1 to 99. Um, but you can also add an alphanumeric component to it uh, to sort of increase the combination of possibilities if you have a lot of events for a given location and year. Um, and then finally, the last component are, are a specimen ID, which can range from 1 to 9,999, again a four digit, well this is a four digit number, um, and you can make this alphanumeric if you have more than 10,000 specimens for a given event. Uh, that's probably unlikely, but you never know. Um, so for example, um, here, ARZ 21020012, we can sort of interpret that as a 12th specimen to get a label. Okay, so that number doesn't necessarily indicate the order in which it was collected, just the order in which it was added, like a, a unique identifier was added to it. And it comes from the second collecting event from Arizona in 2021. Okay, so that's how you would interpret that. The third type of unique identifier that I use are project-based unique identifiers, and that's like some kind of alphanumeric code to denote the project. So in this case, AHE19 denotes anchored hybrid enrichment 
2019, meaning started in 2019. And this is the 726th specimen to get that project-based um, unique identifier. The next step are, are to append determination labels, and this is this is optional, but it should be done wherever possible because it just sort of helps um, keep especially the image vouchers kind of well identified, especially if the file name if the file name has the species name in it, if that file name ever gets altered or um, disassociated from the image. Um, the label data and the determination will always be in the image itself. Um, and preferably these should be printed out, but that's not always possible just for time constraints and things, so a lot of times these will be handwritten as well. But for myself, the components of a good, determin la good determination label would include the species name as we see here, the nomenclature of that name, a lot of people would leave that off for space constraints, especially if it was handwritten. The sex of the specimen, who identified it as such, and at least the year at which that identification was made. Then we image the voucher specimens. So this would be done prior to any alterations or disarticulations that would occur to the specimen, if possible. Um, and in my case, so again, these are sort of subjective. These are just my particular guidelines or suggested um, workflow for this process. But um, I do a ventral and dorsal image for every specimen. If the specimen isn't spread, then you might use a lateral view. So here in this case, doing a lateral view is much better uh, than had I done a dorsal or ventral view of the specimen just because of the um, the way the specimen was field pinned and, and not prepared. So here we can still get an idea of what the specimen looks like. The scale bar uh, and the labels should be clearly visible and in particular the label should be set aside uh, so removed from underneath the specimen and set to the side of the specimen. Um, especially because these images may be used downstream, you know, in some who knows for what purpose, but they could be used for something and having the labels behind the specimen may impede some of those type of visual analyses that may be done on specimens. The background should be some consistent color. Um, in my opinion, the best option is some mid-gray, so in this case I'm using uh, a 60% gray background. Um, and the images preferably, and again, this is highly optional as well, um, but ideally the images would be color corrected with some kind of color target, as you can see in this image. Uh, I found a lot of times cameras produce images that are way off in terms of color, and so having a color target that can correct those problems with the color reproduction is really nice. Another optional step is to do z-stacking, so I z-stack everything because I want to have the best view of all the characters and, and everything um, on the specimen. Um, my z-stacks are, oh, sorry this bar might be in the way here, um, my z-stacks generally are 60 to 120 images per side of the specimen, um, but you know, that's going to vary depending on the characteristics of the specimen, like how large the specimen is and other things. And of course the images should be as high resolution as possible. And in this case my images are, or my camera can produce images up to 42.1 megapixels. Newer cameras can do more and you should do as high as you, you can afford to do basically. Then specimen disarticulation begins, and those steps are generally to disarticulate, store the specimen, and then add unique identifiers to each component. And critically, each component should point back to its parent specimen. And so here's an example of a wing voucher where you have all the label data sort of interpreted and retranscribed onto the this label that was added to this glassine envelope. But critically, 
the wing voucher itself has a unique identifier and it has the project unique identifier for that particular specimen. So this wing voucher can be tied directly back to all the data and the images and everything about this particular specimen. And here you can see it flipped over. You have, um, you can see the actual wings inside and the actual labels from, that were on the pin uh, from that specimen. Other examples um, are various tissues stored in microcentrifuge tubes. So you may, typically for myself, I do um, the antennae in, in a tube set, the proboscis in a tube set, the thorax. That often in includes the head, but sometimes the proboscis is so small that really you have to take the head off to store the proboscis. Um, the abdomens, which is really great for just retrieving an abdomen to do a genitalic dissection. And then the legs would be stored, uh, again, in another tube. And that's really nice to have for um, going in to get stocks for doing DNA extraction or, or something like that. And then on each individual tube, a lot of this same data is um, recorded. So there's the project unique identifier again, so it can be tied back to that particular specimen and all the data associated with it. Uh, it has its own derivative unique identifier that is unique only to this tube and the tissues within it. A QR code to make it more machine readable. The species name, locality data, date data, collector data, etc. And critically, the type of tissue that's in this tube. So we can see just from looking on the side of the tube that this uh, tube contains the proboscis of specimen AHG190075. Uh, so that can be really nice, especially when you can't exactly tell what is in the tube from, from far away and you don't have a, uh, a microscope, you can just read the side of the tube to figure out what's in there. And then the last piece is our specimen derivative preparation. So this might be SEM mounts, wing venation preparations, genital preparations, those kind of things. Um, here's a, an image of such a preparation. So this would be an SEM box. There would be SEM stubs stored within this box. And you could track sort of like from what specimen a given SEM prep came from, what box is it in, what slot is it in, so you can go and find that particular prep uh, quickly and easily if you need to sort of maybe re-image it or share it with another researcher or whatever. So the general overview is to label and image voucher specimens, um, generate and label the derivatives based off of that specimen, and that can include wing vouchers, abdomens, proboscis, antennae, the thoraces, um, and the legs. And that may also include further derivatives like SEM preparations, and all of this is meant to facilitate downstream research use. So in my particular case, that would be things like SEM of timbal morphology, um, generating DNA sequence data for phylogenomics, and doing things like HPLC or chemi various chemical analyses on the tissues to determine things like what chemicals the moths uh, sequestered when they were alive and things like that. So I hope that gives you a good idea of kind of the process, how things are stored, how things are linked, and kind of what can be done with the tissues. Of course this process is destructive to the original specimen, but in my opinion it's the best way of preparing specimens for downstream research use while still maintaining their utility in a really broad way, keeping everything connected to that original specimen as best as possible while also keeping the components separate so they can be examined and have their um, characteristics studied. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know and thanks for listening.